All right, guys, welcome to another exciting episode of How I Built This, Birmingham style. Of course, I'm Ron, CEO and founder of this little tiny cleaning company called Two Maids and a Mop that turned into a big brand with 90 locations across the country and um, it's not hard to figure out. We're also trying to build another brand called Pink Zebra Moving. And today I'm interviewing one of Birmingham's entrepreneurial legends in my mind. She is... Um, <laughs> pretty famous around the Birmingham area and more than likely you've, you've been a customer of hers at some point. Ashley McMakin is the guest. Most of you guys know her as Ashley Mack. Um, her stores are throughout the, the Birmingham area and I cannot wait to hear all about this story from you know those early early days to, to where you are now and hopefully where you're going too. So Ashley welcome to our podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. A big fan of the other, the big broad, how I built this. So, so fun to hear from Birmingham people. I know it's been so fun hearing how people that, you know, we look at in this little local community that we live in have built these really big brands, but they're like anybody else, you know, they're just, just regular people trying to make something right. happen. So um, let's go back to those early days when this was just an idea. You know, what, 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 made, what even, how did this idea of building this really unique uh, business model, how did it even come to fruition? When, when did you decide yeah. to take a chance on it? Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in a family that loves to cook. So food was just kind of always on our radar, you know, whether it's the big Southern, you know, holidays and um, cooking with my mom in the kitchen with my grandmother. And so really, even through high school, loved to cook to my, for my friends, went to um, the University of Alabama, real tad, there you go. and got a degree um, within their business school. And my dad gave me that advice of just, you know, if you're not sure what you want to do, go to business school, you know, and uh, Alabama has a good one. And so I majored um, in marketing and advertising. And there I met my husband, who was in accounting, which ended up coming very much in handy starting a business. Sure. <laughs> um, didn't know that at the time. But um, when we got engaged, um, I started catering some for my grandmother. And she would have big parties and um, whatnot. And so I remember I was living at home at the time and cooked chicken salad for a hundred people and did these little tea sandwiches, cakes, pies, the whole works. And that next day after the party was over, I remember coming home and telling my mom, I'm never doing this again. This was so hard, you know, so much work. I remember I was just a hot mess. I I made the food, took the order, delivered the food, you know, and so I was like, I don't know that, that it seemed like food. I love food, love to cook. That would be a good idea. But I was like, I don't know about that. Yeah. And so um, I actually did look at to go into, into culinary school um, when my husband and I got married and then we realized we were broke newlyweds. And so I needed to like make, get a paying job. Yeah. And so I got a job at an advertising agency and it was there that I met a girl that was in a little cubicle next to me that loved to cook as well. And so we would kind of talk about, we were newlyweds and just loved to go home and cook for our husbands. That was back when that was real exciting. <laughs> and, um, and so we would talk about all of our, um, you know, just kind of family recipes or things that we like to cook. And we said, why don't we start um, a little business? It was very much, a, you know, very much a hobby. Just, oh, this would be fun to do on the side, you know? So we made our own little business cards. It was called the Taste of Birmingham at the time. And so one of my best friends is a drug rep and she had always been, knew I loved to cook and was like, make your chicken salad and let me take it to my drug reps. Like they'll love it. And so my very first lunch was for seven box lunches for this um, doctor that's still a, a customer of ours. And we left, we would cook at night and then go on our lunch break to deliver. And kind of word started getting out once we did it for a few drug reps. And then my uncle worked at the time at Vulcan Materials which is a huge company in Birmingham. And so he kind of got me in on their daily, you know, they would order just lunch for 50, you know, every, almost every day of the week, these different departments. And so um, after doing this for a couple months, I came back to, I was gone delivering a lunch, came back to this advertising agency and I got called into the boss's office. <laughs> and, and she said, you know, I know you and your friend, you know, y'all are doing this business. Um, you know, I'm happy for you, but you know, you were gone for two and a half hours at lunch. So we just, you know, you can't do that. And, and now looking back, I mean, I was 23 years old and now looking back, you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh, now being an employer, but, um, and they were very gracious and they just kind of basically said, you need to, you know, either be here or if you need to pursue this other business. And so I went home, told my husband I got in trouble at work and was like, you know, what should I do? And, um, he was like, at this point, we were actually doing some decent sales for doing it out of our home. 
And he was like, I think you should just keep doing, you know, quit, leave the advertising agency, keep doing this. And so um, that's what I did. And so we kind of still thought at this point, this would be my husband was on the partner track at this accounting firm. And we were kind of, you know, set as far as, um, okay, we're going to start a family, hopefully in the next few years. And that was really my dream job to be a mom. And so anyway, um, my partner at the time, eventually she got pregnant after we were doing it out of our house for about a year. And so she was, I'm like, I'll keep doing this to have the baby. And then I'm, you know, I'm out and I was like, okay, no big deal. So she stopped doing it. And then at that point, um, we kind of thought, you know, if we're going to keep this going, let's kind of rebrand it. And so that's when it became Ashley Max. And that's in 2007 when we found our first location in Bluff Park. And it was a little tiny catering kitchen. And we had a small storefront where it was just going to be for people to either come pick up their catering or eventually our catering customers started asking, you know, oh, I, you know, yes, I love having your poppy seed chicken delivered, but can I get like a small container for my family? And so that's how our gourmet to go was born. So, so um, before you keep going, there's yeah, so much yeah, to yeah, package yeah, there. Yeah, so, yeah. so what I love about everything you just said, you know, and, and no matter if I talk to you or almost every entrepreneur I talk, I've talked to or had the honor to really talk to, you know, one thing I never hear, and it sounds so crazy because they probably taught you this in that business school, build a, bu <laughs> build, build a business plan, have this financial projection, you know, laid out in front of you. But the truth is, in the real world, very few people do that. They follow their heart, you know, they follow their passions. And, you know, that passion generates work ethic, and you know, usually results. So right. I'm, I'm assuming you didn't have a 45 page. We did not page. have a five-year plan. <laughs> we did not. In fact, I remember early on, kind of even thinking like, what are we doing? Like, what have we gotten ourselves into, you know? Right. Um, so yes, you're right. There was no, um, you know, no, no big plan out there. And so, yes, it was definitely born out of a passion and just, you know, wow, people, I mean, I remember telling friends and family, this is crazy. Like I'm just making like norm, you know, I wasn't, a, I'm not a chef, so I wasn't making anything super fancy. And I was right. kind of like almost blown away that people were so excited about everything. <laughs> yeah. And um, which was encouraging, but I'm like, yeah, I mean, I make a good chicken salad and I can make strawberry cake. And um, so anyway, um, but yeah, so, so back to the Bluff Park. So then we started, that was kind of where our gourmet to go was born because out of demand, um, you know, it was something that wasn't a, oh, we're going to start a restaurant and have all these, you know, have the gourmet to go and the catering and the um, restaurant. And so um, in Bluff Park, that was in 2007. And then in 2010, we found our Cahaba Heights location. And once again, that was kind of out of um, demand. People on the other side of town being like, oh, I wish there was something closer. And um, in between there, once again, long story, but we actually had a little pickup location at my grandmother's antique store in Cahaba Heights. And so that was kind of the bridge to, okay, we have this little location in Bluff Park. We want to put a, a bigger location, you know, closer to Pastavia, Mountain Brook, that side of town. And then my grandmother was like, why don't you kind of set up shop as like a pickup location? So no kitchen, sure. but um, people would be that we were only there for about a year, but like that holiday season, it was like the, there was a line out the door waiting on people to pick up strawberry cakes. I mean, I was the one taking the, you know, I would deliver, make the cakes, bring them over there, or, you know, check them out. You know, I was kind of, you know, at that point there was a few employees. Sure. Um, so then our, um, uh, excuse me, our Kava Heights store in 2010. So this is the best part about the story. You walk in and it was already a kitchen. So we had to kind of do a little bit of um, renovation, but not much. We, um, that was a saving grace. It was the hoods that are $10,000 were already in there, you know, it's right. the place we could afford. And so we go in, um, we uh, have the big catering kitchen. There's a big front where we can put our freezers and our gourmet to go. And so I'm like, this is great. I have a huge catering kitchen, which was the big part of our business at the time. We have bigger fridges and freezers so that now, you know, people can come in and get their gourmet to go. And my husband, Andy, we walk in, he's like, well, there's tables and chairs up here. Like, why don't we just serve the menu? And I looked at him and I was like, that's a restaurant. I've never worked in a restaurant. I don't want to own a restaurant. You know, <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, why can't you just do the menu you do for catering and just serve it out the front, you know, makes it sound real easy to the guy that only does the business side. And, yeah, you know, the accountant. Yeah. Does, yes. <laughs> and so I was like, you're making this sound very easy. But he's like, well, we're paying for the square footage, you know, he goes into the accountant side, we need to pay for, pay for this. And so anyway, um, so that's where our restaurant kind of first cafe was born, because until then, like I said, it was all catering. 
pick up stuff. So I, re I actually recently found my notes from opening Cabo Heights and I had a list of like, you know, the tea machine, the um, drink area, like where, what are we going to, containers, are we going to have the straws? I mean, I had not done any of that, you know, <laughs> um, servers, are we going to do numbers? Are we going to call out a name? I mean, you know, there was just all those things, especially some coming from me that hadn't worked in the industry or in that side of the industry. Um, just all the, you know, things I had to learn on the fly. So it's so a restaurant was definitely not in five-year plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's part of the, that's part of the allure of it, right? You know, there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of analytical data driven decisions, but there's also a lot of heart driven decisions when you're doing something that you love, that you enjoy. Right. And, um, look, you wouldn't be here without making good decisions, but the heart can take you, if you love what you're doing, the heart can take you to some pretty cool places in my opinion. Yeah. So yes, that's why I, I love, that's why I love entrepreneurship. You know, we get to follow right, our heart right. every single day. All yes. right. So the other thing I love about this is, you know, one thing I also hear a lot is the early hustle. I mean, I'm sure that you're working just as hard today as you did back in those early days, but it's a, it's a different type of work. Oh, so, oh, it's a different type of work. <laughs> so, so this, this show literally is for people who were you and me, you know, many years ago, mm -hmm. hoping to build the kind of brand that you've built. Uh, and so there's some people that are questioning, you know, should I do it? Should I not do it? Talk about how hard and how much you had to work during those early days so that somebody listening can be prepared for something like that. Yes. Yeah. The early days, for sure. I think I have people now, you know, I'm a mom of three. Sometimes we have two foster kids, so sometimes five and people are like, how do you do it? And I'm like, when I was working 14, 15 hour days, I didn't have any kids. You know, I did that. I was 25, <laughs> had lots of energy. So um, yes, but the early days, um, certainly I think it's something that I took every opportunity I could to get our name out there, you know, whether it's um, going on all these um, local cooking shows or, you know, news shows to, you know, we do a recipe and that was, you know, every, every time someone asked me or a charity event, will you donate, you know, brownies to this? Yes, I will like, you know, whatever I can do. Sure. And so I think looking back, I mean, it's such a blessing that the business grew and to be where we are now that I get to do what I'm able or what I want to, or what I can on that front for the most part, you know, but the early days, it's like, you give it everything you got, you know, right. whatever I can do. And in fact, I do remember early on in Bluff Park, a customer coming in and this was before when we just had the tiny storefront, not the restaurant and um, asked if we did key lime pie. And I was like, yeah, we do key lime pie. When do you want it? And she was like, you know, whatever Friday. And so I go back and I'm like, have I ever made a key lime pie? Let me see. I'm sure I can find a good one. So I don't know if I called my mom or where I found a recipe, but I made a key lime pie and she loved it and it's still in the menu. Nice. And so, you the know, same recipe? it was just, um, the same recipe. It's, it's a little different. It okay. is a little different. I did tweak it over the years, but, um, but yeah. And so, but things like that, that, um, you know, now, um, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look, look at it, I don't have the luxury of just, you know, anything anyone asks for it to make with five right. locations. And, but at the time, you know, that was, uh, um, yeah, sure. What, what can I do? I mean, I even did some private chef events where I would go in the home and cook. I even did that for the mayor of, I'm um, current mayor of Mountain Brook. Um, he had me in his house, um, he and his wife and they were entertaining and my aunt knew them. And I was like, sure, I'll go cook for y'all, you know? So really, I think just the hustle, like you said, it was, you know, taking advantage of every opportunity I could, um, you know, Pepper Place. We were at Pepper Place for um, several of those first summers, you know, getting up at 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Yikes. And um, yeah, it was looking back, I'm like, wow, how are me and my husband still married after getting up at 4 a.m.? And we would like have fights every Saturday morning. <laughs> And you're building a family, you know, you're raising yes, a family. Yeah, not to mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Holy anyway, cow. But, yeah. So let's get back to the story because there's so much yes. more to unpack okay. there. So you're, 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 you have sort of one and a half stores, it sounds like. We will, I don't, right. did, you right. know, so yes. you're now at five stores in, in today's world. So let's right. kind of pick us up from that point to where okay. how we get to where we are today. Yeah. So after Cabo Heights in 2010, um, once I, like I said, the first day we opened there, I was making sandwiches and that was when we were like, is the cafe even going to take off? You know, we'll try it, but we don't know if this is going to be a thing. And so I can remember the first day being like so excited when someone came in and I got to make a sandwich for them. You know, <laughs> I literally think we probably did 
we might have done a hundred dollars. I don't even know if we did that much of sandwiches. And so, um, you know, it was a, it was a slow growth. It wasn't like the doors were beaten down that first day, you know? Sure. And then in 2011, um, Southern Living actually put out an article on me, my, our business and my mom and grandmother. And it was kind of on family, like the heritage of food and the family. And after that came out, I feel like that really helped us, which is just so cool to see how a local, you know, publication would, you know, I don't even know how they got my name or why they called me, you know, right. but um, what a cool thing that that, you know, really helped me. And then honestly, even Pepper Place, like they were great, like place for me to kind of launch and have um, a broader, you know, spectrum of um, customers coming and getting to know about our brand. I'm sure. And so yeah. after Cahaba Heights, I would say in about middle of 2012, um, my husband was like, well, I think now we could do another one. And at this point, I'm like freaking exhausted. You know, I'm like, <laughs> well, we really want to put in another one. You know, after, you kind of like made it to where, okay, we have this like legit location and, you know, our brand is um, growing, but I really thought that was it. I'm like, this is great. We can run this store, you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, we had what, uh, 12 employees probably at the time, 15 maybe. And so um, when he mentioned another location, I think I was about to die, but then, when he explained it, you know, we've done all the work to, you know, make the menu, start building the brand, which was still relatively small, but, um, and then all the processes that come into place, as you well know, with building a business, it's so he's like, why would we not do another one? Like we've done all the, you know, the right. legwork on the front end. And so I was like, okay, we'll, we'll see, you know, <laughs> and as you can see, who won that argument, but so then we put in Inverness in 2013 and, you know, that being our second real location, we still had Love Park, but Love Park, like I said, didn't have the cafe. So it was a little right. bit different. So our second like full fledged cafe, um, you know, that took a little while, of course, with employees and just figuring out how, you know, to run two locations. And we had kind of started building um, a leadership kind of structure at that time, meaning, you know, we, we didn't even have general managers at the time, but it was like a shift leader. And then I would go and um, kind of manage both stores. And then we had some other leadership that kind of started developing that we could depend on to be like, okay, will you check on them for today? And I'm right. going to go here, you know. And then You're just like on living on 280, it sounds like. Pretty much, yes. Back and <laughs> forth between God Bites and Inverness, yeah. <laughs> So all that to say, once we kind of that, thankfully that store was successful. And so then in 2015, we um, put a store in River Chase um, near the Galleria. And so then after that second one, I kind of understood what where Andy was going. He's smarter than me. And he was like, you know, we can do this, you know. So I was on board after that second one. And then we put in River Chase in 2015. Um, while we were actually in China adopting our third child and we had fired our Kaba Heights store. So that one was closed. There was a lot going on that year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, and I can delve into any of that. You want me to later, but so 2015 and then in 2018, we put in Homewood. And then during the pandemic, we were supposed to open our Pizzitz location in downtown Birmingham in March of 2020. So as you <laughs> know, we did not open in March, but we did open in June. And that's been, you know, kind of a slow go, but it's that's our fifth location. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of how we got there in a, in a nutshell. <laughs> wow. What a story. So what I, what I love about all of that is, you know, I can see the joy that you have in telling that story, but as an entrepreneur, I, t I tell people this all the time, entrepreneurs are the craziest people ever because yep. we, we, you know, most people, when they feel pain, you work to either run away from it or fix it entrepreneurs like come back for more pain. <laughs> so, right. yeah, um, yeah. But what's so cool about entrepreneurs is though, even though there's a lot of painful moments as you're building a, a business or a brand, when you talk about it, just like you just shared your story, I saw nothing but joy. And I'm sure that you could talk about all sorts of crazy moments that were not joyful um, as you were, as you were growing. It. Right, right. Yeah, so. Yes, yes. There was plenty of times that I, and there is lots, lots of tears along the way <laughs> of, are we doing the right thing? Is that the best decision to make? You know, but looking back 100%, I would, you know, do it all again. I mean, it's just neat to see how God's plan, it all came together. And um, yeah, it was, you know, looking back, just kind of like birthing a child, you know, you're like, yeah. that was painful, but I'm going to have another one. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of what happened with old Ashley Max. But um, yeah. So, yeah, well, that's what, that's what I, so in our business, we're in the franchising world. 
um, I talk to people all the time who want to start a franchise with us and they're like, what do I do? How do I know if this is the right decision? And I'm like, talk to multiple people, but don't just talk to someone that just started a business because very much like you said, like a new parent, if you talk to a new parent two weeks after they leave the hospital with that new baby, they may tell you to never have a baby. Again. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> so, true. so talk, true. talk to the folks who are, you know, down the road who can experience all the, all the great stuff that comes from being a parent, right. you know, not just yes. the painful moments, That's of very no, true. no yeah. sleep and no food, nothing, you know? Right. <laughs> so um, going back to those early days, one of the things I love to ask is, you know, if you could look in the rear view mirror and maybe redo some things, I'm, I'm sure you're like me. It's fun to talk about the early days, but you probably don't want to go do it again. <laughs> no. <know>? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> so if you had to do it again, What's just one thing, like one big thing that you would do differently today? Yeah, well, you know, it's really funny that you just said this because we did not talk about this prior, but um, Andy and I were talking about this morning, kind of throwing out the ideas of, you know, what could we have done, you know, differently? What would we do? And I'm um, honestly talking to people that have been, that are in the industry, in the food industry that were years ahead of us. We did, we did a little bit, but not much. And now that I know, and I can talk about this some too, um, I'm in a group with some women entrepreneurs that own food businesses and just what a valuable tool that is to be able to network with people that do um, the same thing you do, you know, that you can get, I might have more experience in a certain area than you. And so I think I wish I had tapped into that more when I was younger and when I was first starting of like, you know, there's people willing, I think I'm very competitive. So I think in my head, I was like, oh, that I'm like telling them I'm coming into their market. They're not going to want to talk to me, you know? Right, right. And that's really not how it is. I mean, yes, we're, you know, the food industry, of course we have competitors, but there's, especially in Birmingham, there is room for room for us all, you know? Right. And so I think that's been a really unique thing. Like I'm really good friends with the girl that owns Urban Cook House and Crestline Bagel. And we know the Tzatziki's owner and this and that. I mean, like, so it's just, it's neat to be able to bounce around ideas and not feel threatened by one another you know yeah an entrepreneur oftentimes especially if they're building a brand up you know straight up from the ground they're on an island they're a literal island yeah. in some cases that and everything's brand new all these experiences are foreign to the, to those folks and it can be overwhelming to a lot of people and make you want to run away you know so if you have right. that support mechanism there and you go hey this thing happened and you know, they're like, Hey, yeah, that happened to me too. You know, right. Right. Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just right, right. close your eyes and get through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's so true. Yeah. I just think that, um, I was actually listening to a podcast recently that was talking about giving back to, um, you know, whatever you're in, what business you're in or whatever, and being someone's yes is how she said it. And I was like, that's so cool. Cause I'm sure you do too. We have people all the time reach out to us. And it's like, would you mind if I sat down with you for a few minutes and asked you about how you did this or this and this? And of course we're all busy, but it's just made me want to be like, you know what? I want to do that for other people too. You know, people right. did it for me along the way and, you know, let's all help each other. And I know you mentioned like the entrepreneurial spirit of Birmingham, um, as we were talking through what we we're going to discuss. Sure. And that I think is just, I think we live in an amazing city full of entrepreneurs. And I love that. I mean, you know, and I'm sure you're getting to hear all kinds of great stories with your podcast. It's so fun hearing the creativity, the innovation that's kind of coming from Birmingham, Alabama. And, you know, again, in the franchise world, we bring people from across the country to Birmingham to learn about the business model so right. that they can go back to their market. But when they come here, there's always this sort of like almost reluctance, like, gosh, you know, or do we have to come to Birmingham? <laughs> and, and, but but yeah. more often than not, when they get here, they're surprised. They're surprised at yeah. how vibrant downtown Birmingham can be, right. even even during COVID life. Yeah. Um, they're, they're surprised at the diversity that we have here in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I, and we know we know a lot of these entrepreneurs out there that are doing some really cool things. That in a, in a lot of cases, in your case, you I believe you're you're first to market, not just in Birmingham, but potentially across the country, you know? And so if this thing continues to grow in scale, <laughs> you know, we, you could have a, a, a great story that all of Birmingham would be proud to, 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 oh, to talk about one day. Well, so. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, you know, you talked about like the support network. I'm a huge copycatter. I don't know if you've ever heard that term that's usually looked at in like a negative light. If right. someone's listening to this, that doesn't mean cheat. Um, but there's no reason not to 
follow what other people have already, you know, let done, out. You know? Yeah. And so um, I love hearing, you know, other people talk about their stories, but also, you know, learn, love to hear what type of advice you would give people. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be a leader, you know, you're going to either lead right. people, you're going to lead, even a one person organization is going to be a leader for that particular right. company or business. So if you could go back into your mental Rolodex of all the yes. best leadership nuggets of advice that you've ever heard what's the single best piece of advice that you've heard that you live by today yeah the first thing that came to mind and of course there's many but um is small things slowly over a long period of time and that's not just leadership advice but just in life too that you know we don't live life by these giant moments typically that right. happen maybe every once in a while to us but it's the little things and so you know i think even coming down to character and how we respond to the little things, you know, and then on the flip side in business, um, you know, are we, um, you know, yes, we can have big aspirations and dreams, but it's not like you can tackle that. It, it's you're tackled that by one little decision at a time, right. you know? And yep. so we really, even though someone might look at Ashley Max and be like, Oh, they're young and they did it so quick. I mean, as you know, it's, I mean, it's been 16 years since we were doing that out of our house, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, it really, we, um, my husband always says, you know, we do demand pull versus supply push. So we are kind of like letting the demand of our products and our business, um, pull us to the next step versus being like, let's create this and hope someone likes it. And so, it. you know, just kind of those, that small things, you know, do today um, with excellence, you know, um, and do it again tomorrow and you know, the next day, you know, yeah. versus you, being some huge, you know, goal, I guess is kind of how. Another hidden secret you guys have, you're actually unique. Um, a lot of people I talk to don't have the luxury of having a, a partner, a life partner, uh -huh. being a business partner as well. And it sounds like you guys make a, an awesome team. You, you Your strengths um, and his strengths really combined to make a pretty powerful force. Yes. I think, you know, that's something cool too, that early on, once again, wasn't in our five-year plan or 10-year plan. Um, but just seeing, um, I, like I said, um, really wanted to be a mom and we went through, struggled through infertility and we're so grateful now to be blessed with, um, we have two biological boys, a little girl from China that we adopted, and then we have two foster sons. And so we have a house full now. <laughs> um, and so, um, but just, you know, honestly, early on, I did not know how, even though I was in the business school, I didn't necessarily have any aspirations of like having a career, <laughs> honestly. And so um, now though, just seeing how much I love not only food, but I love, I mean, as you know, any business is a people business and that can be hard. Of course, that's some of the biggest difficulties we face, you know, is right. dealing with, um, you know, one another. But I think just seeing how much I love so many aspects of running a business, which there are so many, you know, it's not sure. just, you know, oh, you know, they're creative and they cook and people like it so they can sell it, you know, and just all that has to go into it. And then Andy, his expertise is on the financial side. Thank God, because, oh my goodness, I don't think I would survive if I had to do all that. I mean, I'm still just like the number crunching makes my head hurt. Um, so um, I just let him handle that. But um, but yeah, he is very, um, very wise with our finances and with kind of knowing, um, helping me see our growth plan for, you know, what's going to happen. And then because I'm more on the operations side, you know, he can throw out an idea and I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and here's why, you know, um, or vice versa. So it's, but yeah, so I do feel like we make a really good team and that's been, um, a great thing. And early on, I do think it was, um, of course, um, a struggle when we were trying to build it together. And of course there were, um, you know, decisions we didn't agree with, but I think that's why we got to where we are just because there was things that, oh, well, let's look at this side. We gave each other different perspectives. Right. And so, um, you know, there's still here and there some things that, you know, we <laughs> might fight about. But for the most part, I do feel like, you know, now it's not so much of a struggle. I always get asked the question of, you know, is that a problem at home? Like, do y'all talk about it at home and fight it? And now I do think it's more of a fun, um, for the most part, there's certainly difficult things, but, you know, it's kind of fun to talk about, oh yeah, I'm going to try this next. And, right. you know, 
So, yeah, because anyway. you love it. You both love it. You yeah, know? It's, yeah. It, it, anything's fun when you love it, you know, so. Right, right. Um, all right, so how do you know when owning a business, even starting a business is right? You know, there's, I, I tell people this all the time as well, that the idea of starting a business is so sexy nowadays. Like it's cool. Right. And, you know, right. something people can be proud of. But not everybody can start a business and grow a business and make it work and sustain itself. So how do you know if you are that person? Is there something that you've learned right. along the way that can, can shed some light on it? I kind of touched on this earlier with the demand pull supply push as far as and, and small things slowly. Right. Um, that for us, you know, we um, very much wanted to, you know, make sure we had a product people wanted before, you know, hey, I make this really good and I have some friends and family that like it, so I'm going to start a business, you know? Right. Sure. And like, so our... Um, you know, our overhead at first, obviously, because I started out of our house was very, you know, minimal. Um, and so, um, I think before, you know, investing a lot of money, we felt pretty, now I guess it's always risky, but we felt pretty good that we could at least, you know, we weren't going to be living on the streets if we started it, you know? Right. And so, um, you know, I do think just kind of as much as you can doing product testing or whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, and there's so many outlets now for that on Instagram, Etsy, you know, or Pepper Place or whatever, you know what I mean? There's sure. a lot of outlets, I think, for creative people. And so and I know that doesn't work for every business, but for some, there's a lot of ways you can kind of feel it out before kind of diving all in. Right. Um, so that would be just at least how we did it, that, it, you know, we didn't put all of our eggs in one basket right away. <laughs> right. And I think... I I think risk is a good thing when you're trying to build a business, but obviously right. too much. And I've seen that in our world, too much risk can kill a great business. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no doubt baby steps early on. Yeah. All right. So you, you've done great. I mean, you got you and Andy are great people, um, great leaders within the community that we all live in. And uh, we're proud to call you fellow entrepreneurs here in, in the Birmingham area. So what's, what's the future? Like, where do, where do you see this thing going? The million the dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, no, we have a lot of um, exciting things, just kind of thinking about how we want to continue to grow, whether that's company owned or franchising, um, you know, thinking about possibly shipping our products. I've been kind of testing, um, you know, possibly looking into, some cookbooks or trying to get, um, you know, some, my, some of my recipes out there, um, building our social media, you know, just all those things, which in my opinion, all go hand in hand is kind of what we're, we're, um, trying to figure out, you know, what's the best next course of action. And so we definitely, I think see Ashley Max continuing to grow Lord willing. And, um, you know, almost every day we get a message, you know, Oh, you know, come to, Atlanta, Georgia, my daughter moved there and she says that all of her friends will get out you know, or whatever. And so we're just, you know, honestly feeling out opportunities and saying, you know, what is the best way for us to continue to grow not only the Birmingham market, but possibly, you know, out, out of Birmingham and possibly out of the state. So we'll see what happens. Well, I'm your biggest fan. So wherever oh. you go, I'm going to be cheering you guys on. I know you're going to be successful no matter what direction you take it. Um, and I'm proud to call your friend and, uh, and a local, like I said earlier, well, entrepreneur I in the area. Appreciate that. And you're kind to have us. Yeah. So I know that everybody wants to reach out to you at some point, because like I said, your, your business is you, you know, your, the brand is so connected to you. So there's gotta be a lot of people out there that are going to hear this interview and say, man, I want to meet Ashley. So what, what can they do <laughs> besides come in and buy a casserole? What, what can they yes. do to meet with you? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, we, I do run our social media, so I'm checking all those messages personally. So you're welcome um, to follow us at Ashley Max um, on Instagram and Facebook. And then I have a personal Instagram page is Ashley underscore McMakin. And um, you can find me on that. And, you know, I would love to chat with you and you can message me through there. And um, yeah, I always appreciate you know, social media is a whole, whole new thing. I mean, Facebook had just become a thing when we started Ashley Max. I remember like, it wasn't a thing, you know, we missed that with college, you know, it was like right <laughs> after all of us. Right. And so anyway, I remember, and then now of course running, you know, especially my type of business, it's just a big, you know, part of what we do, just able to share, um, you know, recipes or behind the scenes. And that's kind of my personal 
um, Instagram page I just kind of got going because people were wanting to see more of like, okay, I'm testing things at home or um, my kids, you know, doing this or that or whatever it might be. And so I'm trying to kind of give some people some glimpses of different things that they might be interested in. So yeah, I'd love for you to follow me there. Well, you have saved my family's hide uh, many a night. Uh, so <laughs> your, your gourmet to go has, has been a, a treat many, many nights in our home. And oh, I'm sure everyone listening to this can say the same thing. So congratulations on living a life of purpose. I think, you know, what you've done is very pur purposeful, purposeful, and it's creating opportunities and jobs and flowing money through the city. This is, these are all good things. Um, and so congratulations on everything that you built and great, you know, best of luck on what you're going to do next, the next chapter. Thank you so uh, much. I really appreciate right. it. Thank you, Ashley. We'll see you later when you, when you take it Sounds national. Good. <laughs> all right. I'll be looking for you. All right.